Skirm always got. All right. Well, hey, I'm Scott Allen Miller. Um, you've all been introduced to me already tonight. Um, as I said earlier, I'm the practice lead for NAC Technology Group. So I'm with the architecture team. So architecture is my thing. And so we've been struggling to get someone to do the kind of agnostic, uh, non-vendor presentations here. Um, all the groups have this problem. It's not unique to us. Uh, and so to kind of fill that gap, I'm going to be starting a series on architectural patterns for SMB uh, system uh, infrastructures, right? So I think this will be kind of interesting, uh, I hope. Um, so this is the area that I'm really uh, involved in. So in working in SMB IT, one of the things we tend to struggle with is a lack of uh, cross-discipline thinking. If you come from a systems engineering, uh, software engineering background, right, as the developers are, they're, they have a tendency, either through academic education or through cultural education, to really be pushed towards uh, cross-discipline thinking. They're, they're told to look at other industries and see what other professionals uh, and researchers and scientists and different things, what they're doing to push the bounds of their field. In non-development IT, we have a real tendency to lose sight of this. We have a tendency to think in terms of technology certifications to think of in terms of click this button, learn how to solve this exact problem for this exact platform, not underlying why does it happen, what should I be thinking about, how would someone in a different field approach this problem. So one of the, one of the things I want to talk about is how we can bring that into everyday IT. And the area we're going to do that in is in patterns. The term pattern, this is the actual definition, so in architecture is the idea of capturing architectural design ideas as archetypal and reusable descriptions. Okay, so <laughs> this actually comes from architecture. This comes from the actual field of building and designing buildings. Yes. Um, uh, Christopher Alexander, I believe I have the right name. Yes, Christopher Alexander, in 1977, um, sat down and said, successful buildings are not designed from the ground up every time. They are, are a collection of well-established, thousands of year old patterns that are reused over and over again successfully. And it's just in putting those together and knowing which ones to use at which times so that makes a successful architect. There's always a little bit of design that's unique, but the basics are always the same. A bedroom should always have a window, for example. Um, and when he wrote his first uh, really landmark book, A Pattern Language Build Without Construction, he did so uh, in defining some really amazing things, such as the percentage and the directions in which windows and bedrooms needed to face. Because people would reinvent the wheel, they'd put windows in a bad place, people would be unhappy with the building. But through lots and lots of research on a large scale, they learned exactly where windows should go to be successful, and that if you're going to not follow those patterns, you need to have a really good reason for not doing it, for, for avoiding them, right? So you always start with the patterns, and if you need to avoid them, do this. Uh, he then followed up the timeless way of building, which which kind of expanded on that. But these two books, which are about architecture, real architecture building houses, in the software engineering world, are considered fundamental reading. Right? It's expected that people in who are developing software know these books, even if they haven't read them directly, because it's uh, such an important part of what they do every day. So, uh, in 1994. Um, I don't want to keep looking back there in front of me. Eric Gamma uh, et al. got together and said there are similar patterns to this that apply to software engineering. And they sat down and they collected a large number of these patterns together, things that happen over and over again, that are successful, that are tried and true, that don't have to be redefined each time. And um, this is a little bit hard to explain, but if you are working in, in software engineering, so um, an, an algorithm is kind of a real low, like this is, this is how they handle uh, list of a certain type, that's, that's considered an algorithm. At a larger scale, a much more complex function would be considered a pattern, so it's, it's, it's more than an algorithm. So this group of four, who became known as the Gang of Four, uh, simply because people didn't want to remember their names, uh, got together and collected this really large work of an unbelievable number of these patterns, implemented them in either C or C++, and put them together in, into a large, incredibly dry book that became one of the defining Homes of software engineering. It is expected reading of everyone who works in software engineering. It created the foundation of modern uh, ideas of reuse, of uh, what made object orientation take off as much as it did. This is one of the most important books ever written in software engineering. And for people who've never seen it, I just grabbed a copy out of my library. 
This is the actual book. Is that I, it's on the show? not something I just talk about. I actually have the book. I saw um, it last time. For people who don't want to read that book but want to get the gist of it, this is the head first software patterns, which takes this book and turns it into every day. And you, I believe it uses Java it's instead of C. It's, oh, it's oh, it's, it's, oh, it has pictures and diagrams. <laughs> oh. and stuff. I'm pretty sure at some point you see like pictures of ducks and you would stuff. Think it it's would really bitter. <laughs> it doesn't get better. And you can go if you're interested. In this, you can go find any language, Python, Ruby, you name it. Do a search on Ruby patterns, and you'll find a book or two that takes all the patterns of the Gang of Four and rewrites them in the language of your choice. So you don't have to learn another language. You can see it in something you know. But so these patterns have a, have completely become the foundations of modern software engineering. You work in any company anywhere in the world, and you're writing a large amount of software. And these patterns and other patterns that have come since them are what you're going to use all the time. And when you implement one, when you use a singleton pattern, when you use a factory pattern, other developers simply look at that and say, oh, that's a singleton pattern. I don't have to wonder what it does. I know exactly what it does. I know exactly why it's implemented this way. I can just use it. I'm not, not reinventing the wheel. Um, and one of the places that we see this real common today <coughs> that actually crosses outside of software engineering a little bit to be heard about in the, in the regular IT field is the MVC pattern, the Model View, model view Controller Pattern. And most people in this room would be familiar with software that's built on that because Spice works this. So yeah, the basic idea, patterns allow for an elegant, simple, tested, and understood uh, architectural processes. The whole point is you know what's going on. You know that other people have used this. You're, there's no surprises. It's, um, so they're like best practices. Uh, and I made some examples to kind of, right, we're all familiar with best practices. So method, technique, blah, blah, you can read the screen. Um, but a best practice is, is a little bit different because it's not an architectural pattern. It's not part of, it's not connected with reuse. It's just something you should do all the time. So good examples of best practices, right? One big great 10. <laughs> I say this one all the time. This really is. This is the best practice. You always start with one large rate 10 array. If you're not going to use one large rate 10 array, that's fine. Five was the best. Yeah, um, <laughs> you always start with one big rate 10 and define away from it, right? The best practices start here. There are certainly times that other things are appropriate, but you should always start with the assumption that this is what you're going to do, and you justify not doing it. You don't have to justify doing the best practice. Uh, never let users run as administrators. We all know this is the best practice. If you don't do it, you will be sorry. Um, always have firewalls on your client and your network. These aren't patterns, but they are best practices. So we're familiar with best practices. We use them every day in every role. Patterns we only use when we're designing, right? So that, that's kind of the important differentiation. I put this example in because I believe this is both a best practice and a pattern. So it's uh, it kind of shows where patterns are kind of a form of best practice, but uh, all workloads should be virtualized. Someone in the community actually confused my writing recently and said, I don't think you, you think very highly of virtualization. I said, that's kind of insane because I think everything's virtual. Right? Um, virtualization, for those who aren't aware of my opinion of this, uh, virtualization is a pattern developed by IBM in 1964. Uh, for enterprise use. It is not something new to the small, it, it's new to small business, hence the confusion. It is not a new pattern, it is not untested, it is not not mature. It is as mature as concepts like mainframe computing and uh, pretty much, you know, every language that we use today is younger than virtualization. Virtualization is a core staple of enterprise computing and has been for uh, going on five decades. So when we say virtualization should be used all the time, yes, there are exceptions. There are exceptions to every best practice except not to use rate 5. There's no exception. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like that. <laughs> but um, there's always an exception. Um, and specific ones of virtualization come around things like low latency trading platforms, uh, which unfortunately Ronan did leave. He works in low latency trading. Um, and the, the pattern there is the virtualization does have latency. So when you're trying to shape nanoseconds, you can't virtualize. You just can't. When you need uh, workloads that are larger than a single frame can handle, uh, you can't virtualize because you're taking one or two percent off that frame. Obviously, you can't afford to do that. But you're in a situation where you're, you're single load, and you're all you would know because you've gone to your vendor and said, "I've purchased the largest thing you make. I need you to make something bigger." Until they do, you can't virtualize. Those are really rare exceptions. In the SMB, they almost don't exist. I've never met an SMB for which they do exist, but in theory, they would. <laughs> So our first pattern, now that we kind of have that overview, this is what patterns are going to be. I'm going to deal with one pattern 
uh, each time we talk about it. And this one is a very simple one, so we can kind of we had time to go through the overview of what we're going to do. So the single server patent, Dell kind of wins because I did a Google search for a server picture. It's the first one. I gotta say, it was not. I wasn't, I wasn't uh, picking on anyone or not on anyone. It just, it just worked out. Um, so the, the single server pattern <laughs> is easy. One. When you're developing systems, you have one server. There's yeah. nothing else. It's just a server. There's no external uh, primary storage by that. There's no um, storage on which there's a dependency. Right? You might share some data with something somewhere else, that's fine, that's, that's not a dependency, but you like you wouldn't move off of something where you use, if external storage was down, you would not be utilizing it. Uh, you, the system would still work, I'm sorry. Um, uh, one of the defining pieces is there's no system level redundancy, uh, meaning that the system is standalone, right? If it goes down, it goes down. That's just how it is. Um, but there is, it, it does not imply that there's not redundancy at the component level. You still have RAID, not RAID 5, you still have RAID 10, you still have a RAID 1 or whatever. You still have two NICs. You still set them up. Uh, you still have redundant power supplies, hopefully. It's not that you don't do best practices, which are build your server correctly, but they are that you don't necessarily build a cluster or something else. This is, this is about simplicity, right? And what's interesting about this is, um, I think in the SMB, in the enterprise, you say this and people say, sure, we use that. In the SMB, I get quite often the reaction, I either get shops who say, we use that, but we wish we didn't, we don't have the money for anything else. Or I get shops who say, you can never do this. You can't have a single server. You can't. You cannot do it. Right? Well, there's a term for this traditionally. Right? Here, I'm calling it single server only because I wanted to hold this back for a second. The actual name for this pattern is a mainframe pattern. The theory of a mainframe is that you only need one. Right? You make it so reliable. There's not two of them. It's not redundant. You have one highly reliable piece of equipment on which you rely. <coughs> if it goes down, you suck it up until it gets fixed. Right? When we say mainframe, people say, well, yeah, mainframes don't go down. That's incredibly reliable. That's a great way to run your business. Okay, if we scale down a mainframe, we're talking about a single server system with no external dependencies. It is powerful because it's simple. It's not the ultimate for everyone. No pattern is the only thing for everybody, but for many cases, this is a very useful pattern. This has been used since the 1960s. Uh, well, it's been used since computing began. Obviously, the very first computer was standalone by, by the nature of building new things. Uh, <laughs> it was very lonely its first day. Um, but this, this is a true pattern. This is what uh, NASA was running on when they sent people to the moon. Right? They, they didn't have redundant systems in the way you would think of them today. Now, what does this server mean? This is kind of important. Uh, this is a huge range of things. On the low end, uh, products such as the ProLiant uh, microserver, HP's little tiny $250, nothing special little box, or something like a Netgear Ready NAS Ultra, which is pure storage, which I put in here because I wanted to kind of emphasize this is not about a specific set of services being, being served out from your server. It could be anything. In the case of the Ready NAS, it might be limited to storage and maybe DNS, DHCP, some real simple things. Uh, in the case of a microserver, you could do quite a bit with it, just, just not a lot of power. Um, Mid-range, which is where most people here would be, looking at things like a Dell PowerEdge R720 or a ProLiant DL380 uh, GAP. These are both you know, the workhorses of both SMB and Enterprise. Every company uses servers in this range for the most part. Uh, and this is what we think of. Uh, and then on the high end, things like, just these are just examples, but the Oracle Enterprise M9000, <laughs> <laughs> um, or the IBM T Enterprise. Uh, these may sound ridiculous, but they have okay. for, for most of our, our, um, our budgets here, but an Oracle, yeah. uh, an IBM Z Enterprise 114 is a uh, full scale Z series mainframe. And does anyone know what mainframes start at from IBM? Don't answer Dan. <laughs> <laughs> I know what it costs. How much does it cost? At least four of a million. Starting price is 75K. You're thinking of the 196. The 114 is new. It starts at I'm thinking of I series. I series, I got it. Yes, I series start higher often just because they're specifically for databases. Yeah, so the mainframe actually. I don't know. I don't know anybody who uses one of those. Yes. Yeah. This is uh these are new this year, the 114, specifically to lower the bar and make it so that, yeah. Not the one person shop is not going to spend 75k on their server. But if you're a three person shop and you're really trying to scale down to human resources, but you're able to expend capital, honestly, an IBM mainframe may be a way to go for you. It's, it's not out of the question. 
an like incredibly powerful budget. machine that would handle uh, the workload of, of a company of maybe a thousand people. I'd like to have that budget. Yeah, <coughs> yeah, it's a monster machine. Um, well, and the M9000. Now, this, the M9000 starts more in the quarter million range, uh, and is when people talk about things in both of these. When people talk about um, SANS, we see this in the community a lot. Oh, SANS, they have redundant blah, blah, blah. I can't get that server. That's not true. These servers are more redundant than any SAN you've ever seen. Right? These things do not fail. I've never heard of one of these going down. Some of them also require things like water cooling. So they're, they're not trivial. Right? <laughs> <laughs> they're very heavy duty machines. I know I'm the M9000 is an SMB sweet. presentation. <laughs> yes, yes. But these do apply. The M9000 is a little bit above, but they're M, like the M5000 in theory could apply to, to a larger SMB who's looking for a specific platform like that. And I do have uh, machines in this series that are a little bit older sitting in the other room. Right, so these are not completely ridiculous. Do they have Meridian? It's not Meridian. <laughs> uh, but realistically, we're looking at machines up here. But what's dollars. important is that even these machines in the mid-range, they're, like, they're, they're the power and the reliability of mainframes just 10 or 15 years ago. So even 10 or 15 years ago, mainframes made a lot of sense. These things make sense for most businesses today. What is the advantage of this particular pattern? Obviously low cost, not for getting made right, but compared to other things, right? If, if you needed a highly reliable system and you were going to price out something really complex versus a small mainframe, a small mainframe may actually be more cost effective, it costs less to manage, this is only one of them, right? So, but in, in comparison to other patterns that we're going to uh, be looking at in the future, low cost is a major driver for this pattern. Simplicity is a major driver for this pattern. And as we see in other things, right, simplicity drives security. Simplicity drives stability. Simplicity and elegance are the things that we seek in every solution. Whenever you're looking at a set of solutions, the one that solves your needs most simply or most elegantly, as we tend to say in IT, is almost always the correct choice. So if this, compared to other patterns, will meet your needs, chances are it's the right choice. Um, performance, what's interesting is, outside of really specific high performance computing things that really don't apply to the SMB, uh, where we're talking about like large compute clusters and major uh, massively parallelizable compute loads, uh, for normal workloads, the single server pattern, the mainframe pattern, is the most performant. Right? So you get the most performance out of every dollar you spend on your, on your solution. So if what you're looking for is speed, this is where you should be started. Um, and then the, the last point is that it has the best relationship of reliability to cost. Now obviously cost, you can always find, you know, it's always that moment where a vendor puts a sale on something. So in the, in the, the general sense, uh, if what you're looking for is to be reliable at a good price point, this is the pattern that's going to suit you the best. Disadvantages. Uh, <laughs> single server platforms do not scale well, right? You're starting with a platform today, and in six months you're going to be three times the size you are today, including three times the workload, not just three times the people, this may be a bad pattern for you. You are locked into what you've done already to some degree. There's ways to expand the pattern, but it's not a pattern pre-built with the intent of growth. Right? Most companies don't experience growth in such a pace that causes this to be a bad pattern, but those cases certainly do exist. Excuse me. Or, um, and the, the other, the, the really obvious disadvantage is there is no system level redundancy. So if your goal is to minimize downtime, that is that availability is one of your key drivers, and in the SMB it also never is. But if one of your drivers for your system selection is mitigation of availability issues, then this is probably not the pattern for you. Key scenarios. Um, in the real world, right, in real businesses of all sizes, from two people to two or three hundred thousand people, this is the pattern that we see most. It doesn't matter what size company you are. The difference is in an SMB, there's a certain likelihood that this is going to be the only pattern. Right? Your entire business is a single pattern. It's a single system. So you have one server. That's your business. Right? If, you, if you're a five-person business, you really shouldn't have two servers. It's, it's really, I've, I've heard of a 16-person business that made $60 million a year. They might justify something you know, outside. This is where you break best, pattern, best practices. But a normal 16-person business cannot justify the amount of money it takes to have a secondary server. If they were going to, and they could take part of that money, invest it in a better single server, stay with this pattern, and get better back to their buck, and uh, do the best thing for their business, better performance, for example. 
Um, in a large business, right? Dan and I work in a 400,000 user environment. It's uh, one of the, I think, three largest IT environments in the world, right? We have more servers than most companies, most of the Fortune 10 have employees, okay? We, as people like to say, Apple's the biggest company in the world. Yes, we trade Apple more than once a day, <laughs> right? The scale we deal at is, is ridiculous. So in, in an organization like that, this pattern applies to something like 90% of the computing resources. There are other patterns. Every pattern that is at all uh, uh, functionally usable is going to occur in, a, in an environment of that size. But this pattern is going to apply most of the time. The average workload, including some really high uh, uh, intensity workloads, ones that are very crucial to uh, trading systems, ones that are very crucial to um, uh, direct interactions with customers, internal use ones, financial controls, they all use this pattern because it actually delivers so much value that it is very difficult to justify in an environment where there are the resources to look at a workload and determine which pattern makes sense, which they do. Every workload is given this kind of justification. Um, and individual systems are, you know, <coughs> they're spending $50,000 on a small system, not, you know, so, so a mainframe is almost in that price range for every application. But it still is the, is the pattern that comes up most of the time. So this applies to everybody. There, there's really no, uh, there's no category of company for whom it doesn't apply. There may be specific companies for whom it doesn't apply, but not because of their category. Because if they have the money to spend on it. It's always the cheapest. If the, any company that can't afford this pattern is out of business. Okay. Other patterns would have to be justified for their additional expense, but this is the minimum expense uh, I mean, to function be a working IT environment. Unless you have, we're so small you have no server whatsoever. In which case, you are actually outsourcing this pattern to someone else. So it still exists. Um, so the ideal cases for this pattern, when considering this, um, systems that are not sensitive to availability loss, which in the SMB is 99% or more of your system. Um, systems with high cost sensitivity, which is which is similar to the first one, right? Um, it, here's, a, here's a quick test, right? And I'm going to go through some of these uh, kind of challenges in a second. but. Uh, of all the people in this room, because Maddie doesn't count because I don't think you administer service. Um, <laughs> maybe you do. Uh, of all the people in this room, if right now, this very second, while I'm talking, your server infrastructure, I don't care if you have one server or a hundred, if every one of them, and Dan, don't read your name, if every one of them went offline right now, and you knew magically that they would be offline until 12 hours from now, at which point they would be fixed, how many people here would lose over $1,000, the business, not you personally, how many people would lose over $1,000 if you went down right now during the night? Two people? Three people? Four people? You're a little bit bigger than an SMB, but well, we'll count yeah. it. And there was, and Dan. Okay, so in a, in a group? Oh, customers you would. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you were sort of hosting provider, yeah. Okay, so. And how much would we lose per minute? We lose over a million a minute. Um, really even, even in the middle of the night. Um, so, uh, so okay, so out of this group, four people would lose over $1,000. To justify leaving this pattern typically requires an, exp a, an expenditure of loss averaging between one and $10,000 per minute. So when you're thinking that this pattern doesn't apply, there are four people in this room who need to think about it. All the rest of you shouldn't even consider it. Right? And 1,000 in a 12 hour time span is nowhere near 10,000 per minute. Right? But there are situations, you have, to, you have to really look at it. But if you're not at least raising your hand for that question, this is your, this is your pattern. It's that easy. Um, but there are.